This is the Unregistered Podcast, and I'm Thaddeus Russell. This is a show about ideas, people, and behaviors that are considered inappropriate, out of bounds, or beyond the pale. The things you're not supposed to talk about if you're a school teacher, a college professor, a businessman, a politician, a parent, a neighbor, or even a podcast host. These are the things you're not supposed to say or even think if you're a good liberal, a good conservative, or a good citizen. Each week, I'll interview a person who has something bad to say. They might be a journalist or a professor. They might be a porn star or a drug dealer. They might just be an ordinary person with an ordinary job who doesn't care about the rules of polite society. I'm not interested in breaking the rules just to be a troublemaker. I'm interested in people who break the rules of conventional thought and to expand the scope of what is possible to say in our society. I'm interested in people who make me think. Since her appearance on episode 76, many people have asked about how Lily Forrester is doing in Mexico. For those who haven't listened to the episode, a little more than three years ago, Lily and her husband, John Galton, went on the run from cannabis felony charges in Ohio, crossed over into Mexico illegally, and began living in Acapulco among a community of expatriate anarchists who formed around the Anarcopulco Conference. I became involved with them because I was invited to be a speaker at the Anarcopulco Conference this year, a conference I knew very little about. But shortly before the conference, I received an email from a film production company called Bird Murmur, who were working on a documentary film project featuring John and Lily. I watched their trailer and I talked to them and I was immediately taken with John and Lily and their story, and I wanted to interview them for Unregistered. Then, 10 days later, on February 1st, John was murdered outside their home in Acapulco. Lily had to go into hiding because, of course, she's an illegal immigrant, and the police wanted her for a statement in the murder case. We also still do not know who committed the murder. So whoever it is has been at large this entire time that Lily is in Acapulco. On top of that, we recently found out that the charges against both John and Lily in Ohio a state that has not yet legalized cannabis, are still active, and there are still warrants out for their arrest. If you would like to let the sheriff and the prosecuting attorney of Portage County, Ohio, know about how you feel about this case, you can go to their website and find their contact information there. We'll put that link in our show notes. Despite all of this, over the last three months, Lily has done something miraculous. She has begun to rebuild her life. Largely, I am proud to say, with the help of unregistered listeners, Lily was able to raise enough money to hire a lawyer to get temporary immunity so that she could speak with me on unregistered and not fear immediate deportation. And one listener of our interview actually donated an entire glass-blowing kit to Lily to replace the one that was stolen by the Mexican police. With the help of some of her Mexican friends, Lily is moving to a much safer city sometime this week and hopes to begin her business and life again. You can chart her progress by going to her website, highlyfunctionalgrowth.com, where she has a blog that she regularly updates and where she'll be launching a series of new projects and businesses. Again, go to highlyfunctionalgrowth.com and support Lily. For now, though, this is the speech I gave at the Anarcho-Pulco conference about Lily and John, about their place in history, and about what it means to be free and stateless. This is my speech at the Anarcho-Pulco conference in February of 2019. I want to tell you about my life and its relationship to crime. So I grew up in Berkeley and San Francisco in the 1960s and 1970s. You might imagine, being right there in the epicenter of the counterculture, that this thing called drugs had a little something to do with it, right? So I grew up smoking weed that was supplied by the growers in Humboldt County. We'll get back to them in a second, right? 
What are they? What were they? They were agorists, weren't they? They risked their freedom and their lives so that we could get high and create a counterculture in the San Francisco Bay Area that changed the entire world. And we need to honor them and respect them for doing that for us. They conducted trade that was illegal, and by doing so, they created freedom for all of us that we're all enjoying right now today. And it's not just the weed, it's the way we live. It's our clothes that we wear, that entire culture around that illegal industry we all benefit from, especially the people in this room. So I smoked the weed, I did a little coke when I was 18, 19, and then I gave it up because you know what? You can't do that if you're gonna be a credentialed person in this society, right? And I had to be a professor, as Jeffrey mentioned, I think. So, you know, I did the thing. I went to college, I went to graduate school, I got into all the fancy schools, I did well, I got books published, blah, 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 became sort of a professor. <laughs> I was teaching in the Ivy League for several years. And I realized after a while in New York City, Columbia University, the Ivy League, Berkeley in the 1970s was getting farther and farther and farther away from me. And I noticed all of a sudden I was a different person. I was a motherfucking college professor. Those people are terrible. God, they're boring. God, they have, they're lifeless. They suck all the life, the creativity, the joy, the freedom, all the essence of what I loved about learning and ideas and history and philosophy right out of the book. My very first day in college, when I was 18 years old, I walked in and I thought it was gonna be Nietzsche debating Plato about the great ideas in history. No, it was a guy droning on and on for two hours. And that continued for the next four years in college, and then it continued for the next five years in graduate school at the most elite institution in the United States of America. And I said, there's something really wrong here because I'm not getting at all what I want, which is simply to talk about ideas freely. What the fuck does this have to do with crime, by the way? I'll get to that in a second. I'm looking around at all these people and they don't even care what they're wearing. They're so cut off from their bodies, right? These are people entirely of the mind and they believe this Western idea that the mind and the body are separate, that the mind is good, that's where rationality and science and discipline and obligation are, and the body is bad, that's where pleasure and desire and sex and drugs are. And they deeply ingrained that, but they thought that they were radicals. Oh, why? Because they're social democrats who want Medicare for all. Oh, so they're the real radicals, I see. Okay, so I heard that. Every week, every month, every, no, every minute of every day, living in that world of the academic left, of colleges and universities. And is that a small institution influencing a few number of people? No, it's millions and millions and millions of people being fed through those institutions, being taught this all the time. That what matters is public policy and redistribution of wealth and getting the right, most important by far, is getting the right person in Congress and the right person in the Oval Office because that's what really matters. No, what fucking really matters is how we live every single day, isn't it? And what these people did not understand was that most important thing. The most famous professor in my entire world is a guy named Eric Foner. I'm sure a lot of you know him. Why? He is the historian laureate of the United States of America. There is such a thing. He's that guy. He was my advisor at Columbia University. Eric, Eric wore the same clothes every day. He wore the same clothes he'd been wearing since the 1970s. When I saw him in a video store in the 1990s, he said to me, hey, what should I watch? Totally cut off from the way real people live their lives, from their own bodies, their own pleasures, their own, own desires. I realized that they were just completely cut off from their bodies and lived entirely in their minds. I was not down with that. I was, I've never been a huge drug guy, but I love getting high, you know? I loved getting drunk. I love sex. I love dancing most of all. Swimming, naked, in the ocean. I'm sorry, is there anything better? Those are the things I love. The hippies I went to school with, with dreadlocks, who look just like John and Lily. They taught me that. They taught me that, to live right now in your body, in the moment, and enjoy it, and find pleasure. And the problem is, to do that in this society, you have to be an agorist, like John and Lily. 
the prostitutes of the 19th century. I started reading about them as a historian when I started getting really frustrated that all these idiots had no idea what was on television. They had no idea what was on their bodies. They had no idea how to dance. I started looking at prostitutes in the 19th century because obviously they violated all those norms and they were trafficking in pleasure, illegally. And what did those prostitutes do in the 19th century? They would move to a town where there were 3,000 coal miners, all men, or silver miners in Colorado, or loggers in Oregon, and there'd be one of them or two of them or three of them. Guess what kind of prices they could charge for sex? Anything they wanted. Guess what they did with that money? They bought their own property called a brothel. They then employed women and paid them better by four times, 10 times more than any other women were making in this country at that time. They had their own health care that they provided for their employees. It was the first health care system by employers in this country, whores in the 19th century, did that for their empl own employees. We're talking about women across the board. Oh, they needed security, didn't they? Because this was all illegal. By the way, they were agorists. They didn't know it, but they were agorists. So what did they do? They bought their own motherfucking guns and they used them to defend themselves. Oh, sometimes that didn't work. So they used the money they got from their illicit agorist activities to pay cops to be their own private security force. This is women. This is illegal whores. This is Jews and blacks and Cherokee women and Japanese women and Mexican women in Los Angeles and New York and Portland and Seattle. They'd great, they created so much power in the 19th century. They were political forces in every city. You could not become the mayor of San Francisco unless Jesse Heyman, who was the biggest brothel owner, gave her blessing to you and her money. All of that earned illegally by women. They were agorists. Just like John and Lily. And maybe some of you. Now, I would never ever tell my son to do anything that John and Lily did. In fact, I would beg him to do the opposite. Because I know the cost of that kind of freedom. But because I know that that kind of freedom makes me more free, makes us all more free in the long run, makes this society a better society than the one in the 19th century, Last, last night, John's mother told me. She allowed herself to get angry at him once. But she's okay with it, at least for now, because actually this was his grandmother said to me last night, I can find peace with this because God damn it, he lived the way he wanted to and he died a free man. So I was in this bubble as a professor at Columbia University, hating the shit out of it. And I started lecturing about prostitutes who were agorists, who were the first real feminists in, the, in this country. I started lecturing about the immigrants during prohibition who made gin in their bathtubs and then sold it to their neighborhoods. And then from the proceeds of that, established legitimate businesses and went on to become very successful, very powerful people too. This country in the 1920s was full of agorists, people violating that law all the time. We got to honor them and respect them. One more story and then I'm going to tell you what I'm going to do in response to all this. There's a man named C.O. Chin. C.O. Chin. He lived in Canton, Mississippi in the 1930s, 1940s, 1950s, and 1960s. He was as black as coal. All right, that man had no chance, did he? A man that dark, a black man living in Mississippi in the height of Jim Crow, right? He's just a victim, isn't he? The story I'm about to tell you, right, is of him getting lynched, right? Getting hanged, right? Getting oppressed, getting denied the vote, right? Fuck that shit, here's what C.O. Chin did. He saw that all these white people love to listen to this R&B music. They loved them some R&B music. They called it nigger music, but boy, did they love it. So he said, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to open a nightclub in Canton, Mississippi. 
because no one else would let Aretha Franklin perform in their fucking nightclubs. Aretha Franklin, a mediocre singer, could not get jobs in regular straight white clubs for a while during segregation, especially in the South. So C.O. Chin, by the way, there's an entire network of these nightclubs across the South. Aretha Franklin would play in this nightclub in Canton, Ohio, in Canton, Mississippi. Little Richard, Fats Dime, all of them. Fats Domino, Chuck Berry, they all came through there. He got rich off that. What did he do with the proceeds of that? Oh, he decided to become a victim and say, the white man has got his boot on my neck. But they actually did in this case, not like the kids at Harvard and Yale were talking about this. The white man sure as shit had their boot on his neck. He bought and managed for many years an illegal distillery. He was a bootlegger too. Distributed a lot of Southern Mississippi with good moonshine. Okay, he wasn't done then because he found out that they had a possible new client, a new business opened up. Martin Luther King was sending organizers down to Mississippi to register people for the vote. Goddamn Southern Mississippi was a dangerous place for them in that time, in the 1960s. There were racist crackers running around with guns, shooting people all the time, blowing up people's houses, burning people's crosses and their lawns and burning people's houses, all sorts of stuff. So C.L. Chin used all his money to buy a whole bunch of guns. A whole bunch of guns Mr. Chin bought. And then he organized a militia. He trained them to use those guns. And then he deployed them to protect the activists of the Student, non, the student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, SNCC, if you know anything about history, you know about this name, this organization. They were officially committed to nonviolence. They had armed guards everywhere they went in Mississippi, organizing the civil rights movement and winning democratic freedom for black people. They did all of that, all of that, because of an agorist. Read the book, Martin Luther King's house was full of guns, provided, do you think, by upstanding legal citizens? No, hell no, by illegal gun dealers. The civil rights movement, I'm here to tell you, that kind of freedom, desegregation, which we all, I would assume, embrace, don't we? We don't like all of what came out of the civil rights movement, but we sure as, like, sure as hell like that one. That's because of drug dealers, bootleggers, nightclub owners, bad people, agorists, criminals, just like John and Lily. So I've been inspired recently because I've been meeting with a lot of people in the black market, drug dealers, longtime drug dealers, sex workers. Renegade University, which is my institution that we've now established, we're about to have a relaunch at 2.0 very soon. Because of this very incredible experience with John and Lily, and also I've been talking much more with people in the black market recently, for my podcast and for other projects, it dawned on me. I was sitting in Berkeley just the other day, about a week ago. It's my hometown. I didn't know this guy because he became the big drug dealer in Berkeley after I left. He's been supplying weed to Manhattan, good California bud to Manhattan for the last 20 years. If you smoked weed in New York City any time in the last 20 years, it probably came from my friend. He knows this business inside out. He sat with me and we were talking. And he leaned back in his chair at one point, and he is an OG drug dealer, okay? We walked by millions and millions and millions of dollars worth of illegal concentrate in his underground factory in Berkeley. He leaned back in his chair in this cafe where we were sitting in Berkeley and said, you know what I am? I'm an agorist. And at that moment, I decided that Renegade University needs to have a vocational program. Until that moment, we were just going to be talking about American history, philosophy, economics, all great stuff. That's what I did when I was in my bubble. But then when I started getting exposed to my real heroes, I realized we need to help them. And so I'm announcing that Renegade University will be opening the School of Agorism. And we will be... We will be teaching, we will begin the very first project that's already signed up. We have the best maker of cannabis concentrate in the country, who is just a scientist, 
but he was illegal for a long time and now he's legal, he's going to teach a course for us and you can talk to him directly to learn how to do this, whether you want to make your own concentrate, you know, the cartridges or any other kind, anything you use for concentrates for cannabis, or, and of course we would never advocate that because it would be illegal and, and agorism, but if you wanted to use the information just theoretically, you could actually maybe sell it too. I will never, of course, that's a terrible thing to advocate, so I would never do such a thing. I'm just saying accidentally you might sell some things based on this information. Some of you, if you listen to my podcast, you know the, word, you know the name Maggie McNeil. She's a sex worker, activist, sex worker for many years. Genius, brilliant person, courageous. She's risking her freedom and her life every single day for us. Uh, before we get to the cannabis concentrate, we're gonna have courses on how to be a sex worker and how to be a security escort. Not a pimp, a security escort paid by the sex workers to work for the sex workers because they need staffing. We're gonna train people to do that too. We're gonna train people how to grow psilocybin. We're gonna train people about microdosing. We're gonna do it all legally though, because we would never advocate anything illegal. <laughs> because I know, according to my training as a professional historian and as a good American citizen, most importantly, that doing illegal things is bad. So, we're also gonna be training how to do security. If, if, if you make the terrible mistake of going fully black market, something I would never let my son do, and this is not funny, because I've been around death a lot lately, I know what's at stake for these people. I would never let my son do this, but those people are my heroes. So I'm just gonna to try to do what I can. So we're gonna teach people how also how to do security because that's what John and Lily lacked. C.O. Chin, those whores in the 19th century, the mafia that distributed the booze in the 20s, were they all nice people? Some of them were stone cold killers. And most of them were assholes. Most of them I would not wanna hang out with at all. Did they make mistakes? Were they too reckless at times? Did they fly too close to the sun? Obviously, because a lot of them died. Many at the hands of the state, many in cages, many at the hands of the really bad people who were invited into black markets that you all know about. We want these people to be as safe as possible. They'll never be totally safe from the state or these evil people who are brought in by the state through the black market, but we want to do what we can to make them safe so that this will never happen again or at least to mitigate the chances, the risks, for people who I think are our heroes and should be honored. I don't know everything that happened in this case, and I can't speak on certain aspects of it. And I'm sure that Lily and John, in fact, they've, Lily admitted it to me. Yeah, sometimes they were assholes, maybe a lot of the time, they're not shy about this. Yeah, maybe they made mistakes. She was 23 years old when she fled the United States on cannabis charges. When I was 23, I was a fucking idiot. I still, I don't know all the ins, I don't know everything, but I am now pretty goddamn convinced still that she is my hero. She is on the run from the Mexican government. They want a statement. She had nothing to do with John's murder, obviously. Wow. But she still is here, Mexico. The Mexican government wants her, wants to talk to her now, wants a statement. She's not a suspect, but we want a statement from her. She is very scared for a lot of obvious reasons. She just needs a little bit of help. So far, she has put out calls. I have put out calls for her. She has raised a grand total in crypto of $3,000 in two weeks. Come on, people. Come on, people. I thought this was a crypto community. I thought we cared for each other. I thought we honored our heroes. Even if they make mistakes, and even if they're assholes, and even if they're assholes to us. 
I felt like I had never met this girl until last night. And I'm in California on Twitter raising money for her, thinking, what the hell is going on? There's some people down there who know her, a part of this community, who can give some money. I'm sorry to be berating you, but I'm very upset about this. I think we need to honor and protect our people who do that, even if it's something we would never let our own children do. And after talking to John's mother and John's grandmother last night, and knowing where he got the strength, let me talk about that for a minute. I didn't know this. I met them last night. They're here. I met, they're leaving. They're gone now, but they were here last night. I met them. John's mother ran an auto parts service department in various dealerships all over the country. For years, that's her career. What do you think that means about her knowledge of automobiles? It means this. When they were driving around, they were poor working class family in Ohio, and their car would start to make a noise, a weird noise. They would stop the car, pull off the side of the road, the entire family would get out and replace the part and fix the car and keep driving. This woman could tear down an entire car and build it all the way back up by herself. She designs kitchens that you cannot believe how beautiful they are by hand. She never stopped working her whole life. She, had, she never stopped working, she never stopped creating. She is an incredible woman, a self-directed, autonomous, sovereign woman who has all the skills, I was just standing in awe of her, of what she can do with her hands. And we weren't even getting to the fact of her being a mother raising children, being broke in Ohio. That is where John Galton learned how to be John Galton, was from a woman. She wasn't an agorist, but she learned how to be truly self-sufficient. So I just want to say to you that I think that if you're really, really invested in freedom and liberty, maybe think about these people the way that I do. I'm not asking you to put your life at risk. And I certainly don't want you to be abrasive and aggressive, overly aggressive and mean sometimes. But sometimes you've got to be. You know why? Because being an agorist, a real agorist like that, is hard, especially when you're poor but God bless them. You guys know Killer Mike the Rapper? I just heard Killer Mike the Rapper talking about this just the other day. He's, he's got his own Netflix special. It's partly about this. He said, you know what? The hood, the culture, all of that that we love about the hood and the culture in the hood, you know where that comes from? It comes from the, the drug slingers and the numbers runners. They created an economy, an alternative economy. Mike didn't know the word, but what he was talking about was agorism. You go into the hood, you go into Compton, you go into South Chicago, you go to Harlem, Bronx, East Oakland, there will be nail salons and hair salons all over the place that give great service that are free or that are cheap, excuse me, sometimes free, depends, depends on who you know, all illegal, all run by black women, all run by black working class women, not Kamala Harris, black working class women. The women that Kamala Harris puts in jail. The women who Kamala Harris put in jail because they violated the code. She liked to put parents in jail. She liked to put lots of people in jail for nonviolent offenses. Black women are running an entire underground agorist economy. They don't know it's agorism, but it is. We are going to honor and respect them, too. We're going to teach people how to do that, too safely, effectively, away from the law, and so that they can make as much possible money as they want. I want stacks of cash rolling up to those women's houses. I want whole trucks with cash in them, just dumping cash on those women. I want them to live forever, and just like Lily, I want her to live forever in comfort and peace. And we can do it. It's really not that hard. Just a little support for people like that on the fringes who are risking their freedoms and their lives for us. I'm not brave like that or stupid like that or crazy like that, whatever you want to call it, but I do goddamn know well that those people are at the front edge of this movement. And I hope that you go tell the rest of the people at this conference that. And I hope that you help Lily we don't have a formal campaign yet, but we will very soon. This is the first time I have ever asked for money on behalf of anyone else in my entire life, even though I used to be a socialist. 
<laughs> right, and that's all they ever do. I never once have ever asked for charity for another person until this day, okay? And I don't even know the whole story, but I know she needs help. So I, I just ask you to do that. And I ask you, you know, I was supposed, my business partner's gonna be very pissed off at me because I was supposed to be giving a big pitch about Renegade University. I guess I gave sort of a pitch of that. You can go online, we're gonna have a new website soon if you're interested in that. We're also going totally crypto because we fully fucking understand what's gonna to happen to us, which is what's happening to media. We know they're coming for us, not yet, but we know they're coming up for us. We gotta go fully crypto, fully offline. We know that, we need your help. So I'm asking you for some help in two ways. To help Lily, I think, which will help you, and to help me, which I think will, hopefully, will help all of us. Most of all, I wanna say thank you for listening to me. I felt an energy here. I don't know exactly, but I felt like you really were listening to me. Um, and I don't know, I, I'm really curious what you're thinking, and maybe I made some mistakes, and if I did, please tell me. I would love to hear from you. I don't have time to, for Q&A, apparently, but please come to me and talk to me. I'd love to talk to you. I'm very curious what's, what's going on in your minds, and I usually do interactive stuff. I don't do this kind of thing, so I really would like to talk to you. But um, I didn't have a speech planned until I walked up here. This just came out of me. But I think it was the right speech, and I hope you agree. And, and um, there's certain things, obviously, I can't talk about, uh, just for legal and safety reasons for Lily and others, but, and Jason. Um, but, but we can do it. We can do it. Those agorists, actually, over decades, those Humboldt growers. I just interviewed a Humboldt grower for my podcast, and you know what he said to me? He said, I wanted to tell my story for 20 years. I've been growing pot illegally in Humboldt County for 20 years. I've wanted to tell my story about how the state tried to crush me and destroy my family for 20 years, how they would fly helicopters over my crops just to mess things up, just to harass us once a year for 20 years. His daughter was born and raised on that cannabis farm in Humboldt County overlooking the Pacific Ocean. Those helicopters would come every single year, he said, and just to harass them, just to tell them that we are here watching you, boy, with your dreadlocks. He said to me, I couldn't tell my story for 20 years, but now I'm free, and now I will. And that's this episode this week. <laughs> Joe, I want to honor those people, and I just want your help. Thank you very much. This has been the Unregistered Podcast, and I am Thaddeus Russell. For the next two weeks, anyone who joins the brand new Unregistered Underground Supporter Listeners Group gets up to 25% off both monthly and annual memberships. Just go to unregisteredlisteners.com and join. Thank you so much. And thank you for listening.